Okay, so I, I had a challenge to, um, to ask you the question if we feel that our technology has in some, way, in some ways um, exceeded our humanity. And Albert Einstein stated this uh, really just after World War II. And World War II was kind of a pinnacle point for technology. It, it, it sort of brought forward computational machines, the first computers, rockets, radar, sonar, and an absolute boatload of surplus equipment was flooded onto the market after the war. Um, in the early 50s and mid-50s, uh, you could go to Tottenham Court Road or Lyle Street in London and buy this sort of stuff, brand new, usually wrapped in oilskin bags to be thrown behind enemy lines, military specification equipment of the finest caliber, and you could buy it by the pound. And it's about this time that I first started getting enamored with technology and buying this kind of stuff and playing with it and breaking the law, transmitting without licenses and so forth. And um, it was all powered by this kind of unique piece of technology, thermo-based uh, um, valves, as we call them, or, or vacuum tubes. And this was the state of the art in the late 50s. In the 60s, this little chap came along, the transistor radio, uh, immortalized by Van Morrison's brown-eyed girl. Um, it's funny, you, you talk about the successes of the iPhone or the iPod. This product worldwide had sales exceeding 7 billion. Over 7 billion transistor radios were on the market at around, around about the mid-60s. The mid and this technology had been driven by the solid-state transistor replacing the vacuum tube. This little chap is an integrated circuit upon which we now embed multiple transistors. We started off with five, maybe 10, maybe 15, and within fairly short order, this guy, Gordon Moore, in 1965 says, I predict that every year or two, we will double the quantity of transistors that we can physically integrate onto a circuit chip. And he predicted it for sort of the next 10 years through 75. This prediction holds good through 2010, pretty much. Um, Gordon Moore went on to be the founding president of the Intel Corporation. And here we see him holding a fish twice as big as the one he caught two years ago. <laughs> it was called Moore's Law. And what it really said was on these very large scale integrated chips, VLSI chips, we would continue to double the rate of transistors. And I'll just give you some sort of timeline to this. Hundreds of transistors by um, 1960 or by the 60s, hundreds of thousands by the 80s, and uh, this grew to a million by 1990. And I just checked before I came in and it was 2.5 billion as of this morning. So this is the sort of exponential growth that the industry has had on the hardware side Here's Moore's Law, and you'll recognize all your old friends here, the Pentiums and the, and the Core 2 quads and so forth. They've pretty much followed Moore's Law. It became the kind of the harbinger for the, for the uh, electronics industry. Now let's look at the software and see how that kind of plugged in to this growth pattern. IBM introduced the personal computer in 1981. And by 1984, 1985, it had become the sort of de facto standard till 1990 when Windows was launched. So from 84, 85 to 90, in just five years, we'd gone from the original Microsoft disk operating system to the graphic user interface. And just a point to, to consider, when, when the first hardware was developed, the software engineers had to work excruciatingly carefully to make certain that they could make this thing work with very limited resources, physical resources, and very limited memory capabilities. Was this following Moore's law? Now, it's kind of a good question. No, it was exceeding it. Now, I have a graph here that was provided to me, a really interesting piece of data from Dr. Peter Swan from the University of Nottingham in England. And what it shows is that around 1995, when they rolled out Windows 95, they started to demand more, more hardware 
and more memory support than was really physically possible. And so you see this exponential growth. And, and now to put this in sort of common terms, because I want to talk a little bit about recycling. Um, when they introduced Vista, it sort of made about 70 million PCs redundant. Monday morning they were working fine, Tuesday they were no good anymore. We had to kind of throw them away. So we, we effectively call this bloatware. And, and we sort of add to the bloatware on a regular basis with things like software patches with security threats, which are the really scary ones. And then this limited life cycle support. If you're a corporation or a bank, you can't have software that isn't supported. So you have to keep updating. You have to keep replacing the hardware to support the software. Asymmetric compatibility. You have version 4 and I have version 3. You can read my files. I can't read your files. I have to buy some new software and I have to throw my computer away because it won't run on my old computer. And this sort of closed system. So again, Peter Swan from the University of Nottingham. The accumulation of e-waste is growing faster than the installed base of PCs. And this is a stunning graph to me because you see the growth of PCs. Since we've been making PCs, we've now made about two and a half billion worldwide. We've now thrown away more than half of them. And, and we don't really know where they are. They're either in the e-waste stream or they're in a foreign country or they may be sort of being used by somebody else, but chiefly, they've been thrown away. So I want to talk to you about some of the issues that the EPA has identified. It's probably one of the worst problems we have in this country in terms of waste. Um, the Gartner Institute, there's about 130 of you here. The Gartner Institute says that we throw 133,000 PCs away every day in the United States. That's like every one of you throwing 1,000 PCs away tomorrow and the next day and Sunday and Monday, weekends included, every day, every day. So this is really a phenomenal problem. And the EPA, this is sort of disturbing too, because that you're not actually throwing them away because there's nowhere to throw them. So you either put them next to the new one under the desk, and then your wife tells you to put it in the garage or the attic, and Lord, for, I mean, you can't give it to anyone. They don't want it. They don't. So let's talk about some of the solutions. What can I do with my old PC? And I've got four really, really cool things here you can do with your PC. <laughs> my, my, my favorite one is the beer server, because it really, it really has some good output. And I'm a little dubious about the sort of zinc oxide fumes coming off the barbecue. That's a 486 uh, gateway, by the way. Uh, or, of course, the traditional, slightly more upper class, Macintosh uh, outgoing mail server. <laughs> or you could do this which is really what most everybody does. They throw the stuff away. Um, I didn't know what to put here, so I just threw a bunch of ideas down. There's a group of people got together, and it, we, <laughs> it's funny because uh, we, we got together at the AWOL office, that, that wonderful organization you've heard about a couple of times already, um, and we met there at 7 Drayton Street about two and a half years ago, a group of local people and said, we need to do something about e-waste. We need to find something to do with these old PCs. And the first thing you notice is it's instantly, it's incredibly labor intensive. Fetching and carrying and loading and unloading and cleaning and repairing. And so we, we, needed, we needed free labor. And Tony and Davina Jordan said, how many, how many kids would you like? And let's turn this into an educational program. And Tony and I went to the juvenile justice system and said, we'd like some kids to play with computers. And they said, how many would you like? And we said, how many do you have? And they said, 800 <laughs> at the moment. There'll be more next, se next session. So um, this was the triangle. This was the sort of magic, and I love triangles. Old PCs that nobody wants, people with a huge need for PCs, I'm going to address that in just a minute, and the AWOL kids to kind of make the whole wheels go around. So we get something that nobody wants, literally nobody wants a huge quantity of old PCs. Tony and I jokingly used to talk about, let's get 20 a week. And now we get 13,000 every four years. So it's grown a bit. Um, remarkable resource uh, of kids and people without a PC. And here's, uh, Davina mentioned about 20%, 22 to 30% of the people here in this area are in poverty. 78% of those people have no access. Oh, I know, they can go to the library. So I went to the library and I said, how many sessions do you have, 30-minute sessions per month? And they said, a million. 
And I said, how many get used? They said, oh, a million. Well, what do you mean? Well, we turn people away. We, we just can't satisfy the need. And just to add to that, a sort of little bit of cruelty here, many state and local government jobs you can't apply for anymore unless you apply online. So if somebody's in a dire strait and they can't apply for a job to get out of the strait because you don't have a PC, you, you get the picture. So um, we threw some ideas together, and it's funny because we kept thinking, what could possibly go wrong? Um, and, and actually, with some kind of strange blessing, really not very much went wrong at all. We, we, we had to find an operating system that wasn't licensed. We had to find an operating system that was friendly, that, was, that, that didn't make people feel like they were getting something that wasn't very good. We had to give them something that was nice. Kids safe, it had to support all the accessories, it had to play music, it had to tweet, it had to, you know, my face and everything. So all those things, all those, all those things you had to give because if you didn't give, you, you were sort of like saying, well, you can't get the real thing, you get this. And this is what we chose. We chose Linux Ubuntu. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful product. It looks beautiful. I thought I'm going to show you the whole screen. <laughs> and um, you can see the temperature in Savannah. I think that's yesterday or the day before, last week or something, Wednesday, June the 9th. So this is the Linux uh, operating system. Um, we then started to sort of ableize it, make it something a little bit special. But the word Ubuntu is really beautiful because it's an African word. And I think that really meant something too. And it meant humanity to others. So I loved it. I said, this is it. This is, this. They wrote this operating system for AWOL, believe me. Um, we did a beta test in 2008. And although the city had a grant to deploy Wi-Fi throughout the projects along MLK, it, it actually physically hadn't been deployed according to the schedule. So we were stuck. And um, All Walks of Life had a terrific sponsor with um, Cricket Wireless. And we approached Cricket and said, look, you have those little modems that you can plug in your PC that get on the internet. Could we, could we have some? Could we have like 25? And could you give us like accounts to go with it? And bless Cricket, they were so good. They came through with this. They gave us the modems. They set up the accounts. We had 80 applicants, I think more than 80 applicants, and we chose 25 people. We put them into a beta test for about six months so we could debug the system. And uh, we've since then had three giveaways. Uh, we've put them into multiple communities as well, a Spanish community and into a couple of churches. And the next giveaway we're doing on June the 29th, we're giving away 100 machines, which are now ready sitting at the AWOL office. Um, I sat down with a couple of friends of mine that are super IT people. And the first thing they said is, how the hell are you going to support this? And I said, well, it's Linux. It's magic. It really doesn't need any support. What we'll do... <laughs> <laughs> they almost believed me. Um, I mean, they were using Windows, come on. Uh, and, uh, and so we built an online forum, and the concept is we give you a PC, we tell you how to get on the forum, you go home, we watch the forum, you watch the forum, oh, there they are, they pop up, they start popping up that next two or three days after they receive their PCs. We call people that don't pop up on the forum because something's gone wrong. Um, the, the forum is amazing. We've, uh, we've had like 400... Um, subjects brought up, questions brought up and answered, and people are beginning to see the answers, so they, they begin to sort of almost support each other. It's quite magical just to read the forum. And, and that's where we offer all the support. How do I do this? How do I do that? Each recipient gets a PC monitor, mouse, and keyboard. They get open office. They get a media player that plays videos and DVDs. Uh, an IM client so they can tweet and do everything else. They get an awolmail.com account. Google gave me 3,000 and told me if you use all those up, we'll give you another 3,000, which I thought was super nice. We give them a couple of hours of training, seven gigs worth of storage online, and then we give them 2,180 additional pieces of free software that they can install with one click, and another one that uninstalls it if they want to. So out of those 2,100 programs, there's just about everything they need. They can do just about anything they want. Kidzui is an organization out of San Diego that makes a filtered internet application within the open source browser Firefox. And you dial up the age of your kid, you give them a password, they can go to YouTube, they can search for anything they like, and all they see is age-appropriate material. They go to CNN, they look up dinosaurs, they get a dinosaur story off CNN. They don't see the murders, they don't see the rapes, they don't see the catastrophes in the world. 
and Kid Zooey is, is super, super important. And once again, the support form. The only thing I do regret is that I've completely trashed Davina's office. <laughs> you know, it, it really, it sort of, I didn't really think about that, you know. And there's another thing I want to say, I'd like to say a big thank you to the CEDA organization because I don't know that they really know this, but there's about 200 monitors in their ground floor of the CEDA building. Thank you, we've got them scattered all over town, they're in the B company. If you guys have any square footage you don't need, let me know, we'll, we'll fill it up. Um, and so here's David Sanders, who is my able-bodied assistant, without whom I would not have been able to do this. Uh, here he is, really happy that he's got 100 PCs to give away at the end of June. And they've all got a little AWOL serial number on them, and they're all ready to go. So just as a sort of a, a conclusion is, I, I don't think we're going to solve the e-waste problem. I think it's really a major issue. And, but on a local level, I think we can try to do some things about it. We've developed some fairly business-like approaches to the application process. We've developed a, a very streamlined, very efficient, highly effective workflow. And uh, we're trying to get the program accredited with Savannah Tech so that we can give the kids some kind of an official ticket at the end. But just in conclusion, I think, I think we've, we've proven the methodology. It's completely scalable. All you need is poor people, old PCs, and a bunch of kids willing to work. And I think every town can be proud to say they've got those. So we can do this anywhere. It's absolutely, completely, nothing scalable. You know, I sometimes wonder, I don't really think we're recycling PCs so much as we're, um, we're recycling kids. And we're kind of keeping them out of the social landfill. Yeah. So, um, thank you.